We hear all kinds of definitions about the state. Some claim that the state is just the government. Some say it's a hierarchical force with a monopolization of violence over a given area. Some say it's a combination of the government and armed forces that acts as a neutral bystander in the interests of all towards a greater public good. And some claim that it's the means by which shape-shifting reptilian overlords from Alpha Draconis control humanity. But while it may not be as exciting as conspiracies involving planet-hopping lizard people, Marxists also have our own unique analysis of the state, how it emerged historically and the purpose that it serves to this day. So let's get into it. What is the Marxist understanding of the state? Welcome to Socialism 101, a series designed to help educate people with no prior knowledge on the basics of socialism and communism from an ML and MLM perspective with short and easily digestible videos. If this sounds interesting to you, then go ahead and hit subscribe and turn on the notification bell below. If you'd like to support Marxist educational content, then toss a euro or a dollar per month over on Patreon to help keep this series going. If you're not in a position to support financially, you can help out a lot by just sharing these videos around on social media. Now, in the general sense, the state refers to the apparatus used by one class to repress another, both directly and indirectly, the set of tools used to secure class domination and exploitation. Lenin wrote in State and Revolution that the state is a product and a manifestation of the irreconcilability of class antagonisms. The state arises where, when, and insofar as class antagonism objectively cannot be reconciled. And conversely, the existence of the state proves that the class antagonisms are irreconcilable. So contrary to what capitalist society would have us believe, the state is not merely a neutral bystander in affairs that protects and supports all people equally regardless of their class. Rather, it exists specifically to protect the interests of the exploiting class, today the bourgeoisie, which necessarily comes at the expense of the interests of the exploited class, today the proletariat. Engels wrote in anti during that society thus far based upon class antagonisms had need of the state, that is, of an organisation of the particular class which was, at that moment in time, the exploiting class. An organisation for the purpose of preventing any interference from without with the existing conditions of production and, therefore, especially for the purpose of forcibly keeping the exploited classes in the condition of oppression corresponding with the given mode of production. Slavery, serfdom, wage labour. And we can trace the emergence of the state historically. In pre-class society, there was no state. The rise of the state followed the rise of social classes, specifically at the point of transition from pre-class society to slave society and its corresponding slave state, exemplified in the ancient Athenian city-state. But how did we get from pre-class primitive communist hunter-gatherer societies where all property was held in common to this slave society? Well, with the advent of agriculture and pastoralism, a new surplus of products came into being. The matrilineal mother right of primitive communist society was overthrown in order to facilitate inheritance and intergenerational accumulation under patrilineage. With the newly formed patriarchal family unit, private property began to accumulate across generations. Beyond pastoralism's ownership of animals, humans themselves quickly became private property, something which would have been impossible in earlier hunter-gatherer societies as there simply wasn't enough food to go around. And so classes emerged, slave owners and slaves. In contrast to the primitive communist mode of production, the new slave-owning mode of production depended on strict class divisions. However, as the slave owners were heavily outnumbered by the slaves, this mode of production could only be maintained by force of arms wielded by a group working in service of the exploiting class that was necessarily detached from the broad masses of society. The state was thus established by the exploiting class as a way of maintaining the class relations that had emerged from the private property that accumulated out of agriculture and pastoralism facilitated by the patriarchal family unit system of inheritance. We take armed forces like the military and the police for granted today, but prior to the slave state and pre-class society, it was the people themselves who used force. For example, one tribe might go to war with another tribe, but neither would have had detached armies or police forces as such. However, with the rise of class society, there emerged armed groupings that were detached from the broad masses of people, bought off by the exploiting class, in order to maintain the particular relations of production which benefited the ruling class. With the advent of slave society's slave state, the true people in arms organised for its self-defence in its gentes, fratries and tribes was replaced by an armed public force in the service of these state authorities and therefore at their command for use also against the people. The ancient state was, above all, the state of the slave owners for holding down the slaves, just as the feudal state was the organ of the nobility for holding down the peasant serfs and bondsmen, and the modern representative state is the instrument for exploiting wage labour by capital. 
So we can see that since the dawn of class society, and specifically class society alone, the state has been an apparatus of class domination, securing the rule of those who benefit from the exploitation of the oppressed classes by force of arms, whether under slave society, feudalism, or even today under capitalism. Now, we've spoken a bit about the role of the state in general terms and why it emerged historically, but what is the state specifically? What are its constituent parts? At its core, Lenin writes that a standing army and police are the chief instruments of state power. But beyond this core of the military and the police, Engels further explains that it consists not merely of armed men, but also of material appendages, prisons, and institutions of coercion of all kinds of which pre-class society knew nothing. When we consider institutions of coercion, this necessarily deepens and complicates our understanding of what constitutes the state. Suddenly we need to consider things like the education system and religious institutions and how they're used to reinforce the society's relations of production. A distinction thus emerges between repressive state apparatuses and ideological state apparatuses. Repressive state apparatuses refers to the police, the courts, the prisons, but also the army, and above this ensemble the head of state, the government and the administration. Repressive suggests that the state apparatus in question functions by violence, at least ultimately since repression, for example administrative repression, may take non-physical forms. So these repressive state apparatuses constitute the core of the state that all Marxists agree on. The police, the army and the totality of the bureaucratic apparatuses used to violently enforce class dictatorship. However, when we take Engels' assertion that the state refers to institutions of coercion of all kinds, this forces us to expand our understanding into what Althusser would come to label ideological state apparatuses as well. The distinction between repressive state apparatuses and ideological state apparatuses is that repressive state apparatuses function primarily by violence and secondarily by ideology, whereas ideological state apparatuses function primarily by ideology and secondarily by violence. Class domination is thus enforced not only violently by one unified repressive state force, but also coercively through numerous seemingly disparate ideological state apparatuses, such as the religious ISA, the system of different churches, the educational ISA, the system of different public and private schools, the family ISA, the legal ISA, the political ISA, the political system including the different parties, the trade union ISA, the communications ISA, press, radio and television etc, and the cultural ISA, literature, the arts, sports etc. Note that both public and private schools are included under the educational ideological state apparatus. Althusser expands on this by arguing that it is unimportant whether the institutions in which they are realised are public or private. What matters is how they function. Private institutions can perfectly well function as ideological state apparatuses. We can apply this same explanation to the distinction between state-run public media outlets on the one hand and private media outlets on the other, both of which ultimately carry out the very same function of coercively maintaining class domination in order to protect the society's relations of production and perpetuate the exploitation of the oppressed classes. Today we've taken a look at the Marxist conception of the state. We began by looking at where the state came from by looking at how classes materialised historically out of the accumulation of private property facilitated by the patriarchal family unit. In order to maintain the new exploitative class relations that had emerged between slave owners and slaves, the exploiting class assembled detached armed forces to maintain the subjugation of the enslaved class, thus creating the first state and formalising into the first class society in human history in the process, slave society. The state continued to be used as the apparatus by which the exploiting class would maintain their class domination throughout the course of slavery, feudalism and continues now today under capitalism. Following this historical explanation for the emergence of the state, we proceeded to look at what exactly constitutes the state, firstly looking at the core repressive state apparatuses of the police, military, prisons, courts, as well as the government head of state and administration, all of which ultimately function primarily through violence. And secondly, we looked at the coercive ideological state apparatuses, such as institutions of education, religion, culture, family, the media, and so on, which, regardless of whether private or public sector, function primarily to ideologically maintain the exploitative relations of production in service of the ruling class. Now, it should be clarified that not all Marxists explicitly consider ideological state apparatuses to be part of the state per se, but rather just part of the broader societal superstructure that reinforces the base. However, Marxists are largely in agreement on the violent core of the repressive state apparatuses, or simply just state apparatus. 
To explore this topic of RSAs and ISAs and make up your own mind on the matter, have a read of Althusser's essay, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, which you'll find linked in the description box below. If you'd like a more thorough historical materialist explanation of how the state emerged with the transition to class society, which we very briefly skimmed over earlier, have a read of Engels' Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. For more foundational works on the state, be sure to have a read of Chapter 3 from Engels' Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, or the larger anti Ring from which it's drawn, as well of course as the monumental State and Revolution by Vladimir Lenin. All are linked below. After you've gotten through them, it'll be crystal clear that the state isn't just a neutral bystander that serves everyone equally regardless of class, as the liberals and conservatives would have us believe. Nor is the state itself the root cause of all social ills in society, meaning we can simply abolish the state and everything will be A-OK -okay in the world. While private property remains intact, if we abolish the state there will continue to be classes of possessors and those who possess nothing. The possessing classes will then in turn simply use their wealth to hire their own personal private armed forces to protect their private property, which will once again develop back into a full state apparatus because capital necessitates expansion and that expansion will necessitate further forces to maintain and we'll find ourselves right back at square one. This is why Marxists emphasise that in order to abolish the state we first need to abolish the conditions which have given rise to it historically, meaning abolition of private property and all class distinctions by proletarianising the entire population worldwide. Then and only then will the state be able to permanently be abolished as we'll have torn out the roots of private property from which it grew. Only then will we finally be able to achieve stateless, classless, moneyless society. Right, thanks very much for watching this video, hopefully you found it useful in one way or another and you have a stronger understanding of the Marxist conception of the state after it. We'll return to the question of the dictatorship of the proletariat and how the state withers away in a later video. Thanks very much especially to the supporters on Patreon who've made this one possible. Thank you Ian McShay, Ugopnik, Borku Gorilla, Ryan Hodgson, Soup, Madeline, Sonic232, Sagan, Michaela Schmid, Christian Napalis, Alfonso Dingo Torres, Southern Conrad, Mikhailova, Rock Artist, Grangri, Todd Sprang, Nike the Sage, Zakasi, Anglo Irish Bolshevik, Amy Schmidt, Eloy Leslie, Thomas Rossum Wood, Jason Schmidt, Del Seabold, Train H13, Mios Fur, Mitch Schiller, Six Nivalen, Roja, MLM in Practice, Brian Ruse, Eric Lindahl, ZK Goody, Coil Rap, Robert Jarzak, Doc Toma, Oyob Farah, Becky, Pastor Schubert, Mr. Miyamoto, Coil King, Reverend Lon Nome Hollywood, Wonderbad, JT Chapman, Jose, Joseph Shepard, Jack Schneidman, Comrade Amara, Wilt for the 99%, Spoop, and Trailer Park Communists. Cheers, everyone. August Longfowl.